When one gives up the Christian faith, one pulls the right to Christian morality out from under one's feet. This morality is by no means self-evident. Christianity is a system, a whole view of things thought out together. By breaking one main concept out of it, the faith in God, one breaks the whole. That was a quote from Frederick Nietzsche's 1888 work, Twilight of the Idols. Such is the nature of the modern world at large, and the historical tendency of collective revolt, that a real-world modern example of this weeping and gnashing of the teeth of the ungodly masses is clear in outrage culture. In relation to professional sports, many sports fans can get emotionally invested to the extreme and verbally lash out in a tirade of abuse, seemingly adopting their team's failure as a personal failure or their team's success as a personal success. If their team loses, the overly emotionally invested fan will feel personally attacked, since evidently the bread and circus wasn't as good as they had hoped it would be. Simultaneously, every one of these fans narcissistically considers themselves the measure of all things, so they are subject to their own concept of morality, ethics, and conduct. Since there is no longer a universal sense of civility or decorum, in the face of adverse outcomes. Meanwhile, the sporting club president or sporting governing body, acting as an authority, makes a media release or statement detailing the mental effects and unintended consequences such vitriolic, toxic fan behaviour may have on people. This appeal is made in a somewhat futile effort to keep the peace. As we can see, Nothing has changed significantly from Greco-Roman times, the Colosseum and the gladiatorial games. The magnitude of raw emotion and reflected glory remains, yet the consequences of defeat in the arena are obviously not as brutally violent. It is the loss of God and subsequent transvaluation of authority that has changed Western man and exacerbated his beastly characteristics. The transvaluation of values, or re-evaluation of all values in the West, relates to Nietzsche's critique of Christianity. Nietzsche asserts that Christianity, not only as a religion, but also as the predominant moral system of the modern world, inverted nature and was hostile to life elevating the weak over the strong, exalting that which is ill-constituted and weak at the expense of that which is full of life and vitality. It is Nietzsche's contention that Christianity limits and lowers humankind by referring to its natural and inevitable instincts as depraved or sinful. As per Nietzsche, Sex is a fundamental affirmation of life, for it is the very process by which human life is created. Thus, Christianity's elevation of chastity, including, for example, the story of Mary's virginal pregnancy, is counter to the natural instincts of humanity, and therefore a contradiction of what is natural. Nietzsche's enthusiasm for what he called transvaluation, stemmed from his contempt for Christianity and the entirety of the moral system that flowed from it. Indeed, his contempt of man, man being Christian at the time. Thus, transvaluation would essentially mean to challenge or invert all of Christianity's teachings, particularly its oppressive moral framework. In the Christian civilization, the Christian's primary authority is God, whose word is interpreted by the church. So if there is no God, then there is no authority. The law acts as an authority, 
but the law is subject to change over time, dependent upon the concept of morality that the majority chooses to adopt at any time. Without a true authority, nobody has any greater legitimacy than anybody else. Nobody has anything more than an opinion to which everyone is apparently entitled, no matter how uninformed. Therefore, the masses possess authority as there may be more people who share the same opinion. Nowadays, the strength of the masses is purely quantitative, not necessarily qualitative, when originally strength was purely qualitative, as the strongest opinion was that which was deemed closest to God's will. Hence the divine right of a monarch or the qualitative authority of the clergy as the only earthly conduit of God's word through interpretation of the Bible, much like present-day Islamic culture and the Quran. In Islam, what the Quran dictates is authoritative. Given Islam is not liberal, there is no concept of individual opinion or the opinion of the masses, only the opinion or will of Allah, as stipulated in the Quran. In the Islamic culture, since Muslims are so strictly religious, the Quran will always triumph over any other opinion, even scientific opinion. The Islamic people are only implementing their God's will, whilst in the post-Enlightenment West, the people, either individually or by collective majority, implement their own will. In the modern political realm, Democracy is the constant competition of crowds against each other, battling to form the majority and have their contention commonly agreed upon to become objective within the society. The dichotomy between Western and Islamic culture should surely be clear by now. Islamic culture is strictly religious, whilst modern Western culture is strictly secular. Thus, it could be argued that both are on the opposite extremes of a spectrum. Islam has limited freedom, whilst the West has excessive freedom. It is no wonder Islam has such disdain for the West. As German journalist Hans Zerrer wrote in his prophetic book, Man in This World, once the facade of authority has been destroyed, the appetite for attack grows. Though in tearing down authority, Man is conscious of a poignant loss, yet the sense of loss may at first be swallowed up by the sense of increased liberty, arousing great expectations for the future. The fundamental critique here is that the West is primarily responsible for its own cultural destruction, in no small part due to the Enlightenment. Excessive Western liberalism has eaten away at Western culture. If one wants to affirm a respect for authority or even just objective cultural standards, one must reaffirm a respect for God. One can never be a totally atomized individual in the world. Even the idea of being atomized is always thought of in relation to others through the language of both our inner and outer voices. Consider those who say they are different or unique Compared to whom? Others, of course. How about those who say they don't care what others think? They often do care and seek validation and recognition from others. Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit infers that each self-consciousness belongs to a larger collective self-consciousness. The laws of thought, morals and conventions belong to the social life. This set of laws governing the collective consciousness, Hegel called spirit. The spirit is the place of ethical laws and customs. Individuals interpret and act according to the laws and customs individually, but they are in compliance with community spirit. Hans Zerrer wrote, when man appears to be self-sufficient and autonomous, it is from social confirmation. 
the collective body steps into the place of godly opposite, or God. It has the advantage of being visible and tangible, and its presence is continuous, and it does confer a form of reality, an immediate security and completion. The whole of man's being cannot accept this, however, and the collapse of his existence, bolstered up by the body collective, is at some time inevitable. It is clear to say man has lost a lot of introspection and substance by losing God. The collective body, the masses, can provide man with the form or shell of being self-sufficient and autonomous, whilst respect for God and no doubt eventual faith in God provides the substance of higher purpose as an individual to act in accordance with something seen as greater than oneself. It seems the Western Christian argument is that if you as an individual have a relationship with God, then you are autonomous and secure, because the relationship is a personal one between yourself and faith. It is your decision to make and your relationship to either foster or neglect in trying to develop yourself. A paraphrased quote from American author and political theorist Patrick J. Deneen in his 2018 work Why Liberalism Failed is as follows. Education in the wisdom, the lessons, and the cautions of the past grants one the achievement of liberty governed by the discipline of virtue. The true classical historical definition of liberty was not the modern idea of freedom within the law, or even an absence of external constraint, but the discipline of self-command, the result of a long process of learning. In the pre-modern view as outlined by Deneen, liberty is learned capacity to govern oneself using the higher faculties of reason and spirit through the cultivation of virtue. The condition of doing what one wants is defined in this pre-modern view as one of slavery, in which we are driven by our most base instincts to act against our better judgment. Therefore, by this logic, if one does not cultivate true virtue and instead gives in to their base urges in the pursuit of senseless pleasure, one is not strong and free, but weak and enslaved. You are free because you're disciplined, and thus freer from your beastly characteristics. When you seek to cultivate virtue, you place yourself on a higher plane than just thinking of yourself as an animal.